Hello, and welcome to the first part of the introductory webinar on the use of solar-induced fluorescence and LIDAR to assess vegetation change and vulnerability. I'm Dr. Erica Podest, and I'm a scientist in the Earth Science Division at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, located in Pasadena, California. This series contains four sessions jam-packed with information and amazing guest lectures. The first two sessions will cover LIDAR, and the last two will cover solar-induced fluorescence. Today's session will cover the fundamentals of LIDAR, as well as a demo on the use of ISAT-2 data, which is a NASA LIDAR in space. Each webinar will be in both English and Spanish on the same day. There will be homework associated as part of this webinar series, and the homework will be announced at the end of the series as well as the due date. In order to receive a certificate of completion, you must have attended all the live sessions and completed the homework. Finally, you will be able to access the presentation material and the recordings online in a couple of days after each live session. So here we have an overview of this webinar series. Today I'll cover the fundamentals of LIDAR and its applications and immediately afterwards, there will be a short presentation on ISAT-2 and how to access and analyze ISAT-2 LiDAR data, which is a NASA LiDAR sensor in space. We'll have a couple of guest lectures that will cover this part. Amy Neunschwander, who's a research scientist at University of Texas at Austin, and ISAT-2 science team member for vegetation. Nicholas Kutlinski, He's with the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder, and Sabrina Delgado Arias, Applications Coordinator for ISAT-2, based at NASA Goddard. On Thursday, March 18th, there will be another a demo, this time on how to access and analyze JEDI LIDAR data, which is another NASA LIDAR sensor in space. This one is on the International Space Station. And We'll have guest lecturer Cold Creeble, who's a remote sensing data scientist at the LPDAC, which is the NASA Data Archive Center that houses the JEDI data. On Tuesday, March 23rd, the focus will be on the fundamentals of solar-induced fluorescence, or SIF, and its applications. And we'll have guest lecturer Christian Frankenberg, who's a professor at the California Institute of Technology and a research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. On March 25th, we'll have a demo on how to access and analyze SIF data for vegetation studies, and that will be led by guest lecturers Philip Kohler from the California Institute of Technology and Karen Ewan from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. During this webinar series, there will be a number of different data sets covered, as well as different tools and software. Everything that will be covered is openly and freely available. Also, remember that at the end of each session, there is a Q&A um, period, and so you will be able to post your questions, and um, I and the rest of the guest lecturers will be answering all of the, uh, the questions that you post on the chat box. Learning Objectives by the end of this session, you'll be able to understand the fundamental concepts of LIDAR, the applications of LIDAR data, the characteristics of ISAT-2 LIDAR data, and how to access and analyze ISAT-2 LIDAR data. There are generally two main types of remote sensing sensors, passive and active. Passive sensors measure radiation naturally reflected or emitted from the surface of the Earth, the atmosphere, or clouds. The primary source of energy for passive remote sensing is the sun. Examples of passive sensors are optical images from MODIS, Landsat, and Sentinel-2. Active sensors have their own illumination source, such as radars, sonars, and lidars. Since active systems have their own illumination source, they can operate in daytime and nighttime conditions.
So LIDARs are active systems. LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. A LIDAR uses light energy emitted from a laser. The system sends narrow beams of pulses of light towards the surface. The pulse reflects off objects on the ground, such as tree branches, the soil, buildings, etc., and returns towards the sensor where it is recorded. A LiDAR system measures the time it takes for emitted light to travel to the ground and back. So let me just explain. So photons are the fundamental particles of light. Light energy is a collection of photons. Now think of a pulse of light as a clump of time-stamped photons. As the pulse hits a target, some of those photons will reflect back and be recognized by the LiDAR sensor. So that would be an echo, an echo has been received. And therefore the source of that echo is a location that was hit by a pulse and from which photons were reflected. That time is used to calculate the distance travel. Remember, for a LiDAR, time is distance. The distance travel is then converted to elevation. Distance is calculated by taking the travel time and multiplying it by the speed at which the pulse travels, which is the speed of light. This is then divided by two to account for the fact that the light traveled to the surface and back to the sensor. The next step is figuring out the elevation of the ground. And for that, you take the altitude of the sensor, calculate it through a GPS receiver, and then you subtract the distance calculated previously. This is the very basis of LiDAR. There are, however, other complexities to account for. In this cartoon, there's an aircraft pointing the, the beam straight down, which is the simplest case. LiDAR sensors usually scan the surface of the Earth from side to side to cover a larger area when flying, and therefore the pulse is not always looking straight down, but also at varying angles. The angle of the pulse, therefore, also needs to be taken into account in your distance calculation. Along with that, you need to take into account your exact position and account for the attitude of your spacecraft or the tilt in your aircraft. One emitted pulse can and often does yield multiple echoes or reflections. For example, in the case of a tree or trees, a LiDAR pulse can travel through the vegetation and reflect from different components of the vegetation and even reflect off the ground. Here you can see multiple returns, one from the top of the canopy, the other two from the middle and lower parts of the understory, and the fourth return from the soil. The plot that you see shows the distribution of energy that returned to the LiDAR sensor. This is called a waveform, and the amount of energy that returned to the sensor is called intensity. The peaks on the waveform are objects such as a group of leaves, a branch, etc., with greater reflection, meaning this is where more photons or light energy returned to the sensor. You might be wondering, how does the LiDAR signal penetrate through the canopy? LiDAR doesn't penetrate the vegetation per se, meaning it's not an X-ray. However, if sunlight can reach the forest floor, such as the example in this picture, then so can the laser pulse. So LiDAR can get through vegetation thanks to the gaps in the vegetation. Now, the more gaps in the canopy, the greater the probability that your pulse will penetrate all the way through. Of course, the denser the canopy, that probability decreases. There are other factors that play a role in penetration through the canopy such as the density of the LiDAR points, expressed as LiDAR points per square meter, also the power of your beam, and also your scanning angle. So the greatest penetration occurs when the LiDAR sensor is looking straight down, and that penetration decreases as the scanning angle increases. 
This ability for LiDAR to penetrate through the canopy and collect reflections off different components of the canopy and even the soil allows us to extract information about the structure of ecosystems such as tree height, understory, vertical and horizontal structure, and derived metrics such as biomass and characterization of species habitats based on structure. You can also derive digital elevation models. There are three main types of LiDAR platforms, ground-based, airborne, and satellite. Ground-based LiDARs or terrestrial LiDAR systems, TLS, can create highly accurate measurements of the landscape. And the same goes for airborne LiDAR platforms such as helicopters, airplanes, or drones. However, the downside is that you cannot collect these measurements everywhere in the world on a continuous basis, which is why satellites are so important. This figure shows a comparison between airborne and spaceborne LiDARs. The footprint of the airborne LiDAR is much smaller than that of the spaceborne LiDAR. As a result, airborne LiDARs have a greater level of detail, usually at the level of individual trees. Spaceborne LiDARs have larger footprints on the order of 12 to 60 meters, and hence the measurement is representative of the heterogeneity within the footprint. Spaceborne LiDARs are affected by dust and clouds. However, they can collect measurements both in the day and at night. One thing to note is that spaceborne LiDARs are sampling missions and not mappers. This presentation is primarily focused on spaceborne LiDAR systems. Laser altimeters operate in the green or in the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. LiDARs operating at 1064 nanometers in the near-infrared near -infrared range of the spectrum are ideal for vegetation studies because the signal reflects well off vegetation. So rather than being absorbed by the vegetation, it reflects. However, it cannot penetrate below the surface of the water. The reason for this is because water absorbs the energy from the near-infrared laser rather than reflecting it. JEDI's LiDAR sensor operates at 1064 nanometers. Now, LiDARs operating at 532 nanometers in the green part of the spectrum can penetrate through water. The ISAT-2 LiDAR operates at 532 nanometers, and if there is clear water, clear water, that's the key point, the LiDAR can detect the seafloor up to 30 meters below the surface. There are three different laser detector modalities, discrete, full waveform, and photon counting. Discrete records individual returns representing only the peaks in the waveform curve. Such a system records usually between one to five returns from each laser pulse. And a collection of discrete return LiDAR points is called a LiDAR point cloud. Full waveform records the entire distribution of returned light. These data are more complex to process, but they usually contain more information than discrete data. Finally, photon counting, it uses a low power laser pulse. The detectors used are sensitive at the single photon level. And these systems record the arrival time associated with the single photon detection occurring anywhere within the vertical distribution of the reflected signal. Now I will discuss each of these detector modalities in more detail. As mentioned in the previous slide, for discrete LiDARs, the sensor records individual returns representing the peaks in the waveform curve. These sensors record a return or echo only if the incoming signal exceeds a predefined threshold of intensity. This means that echoes reflected from certain objects, such as for example a branch, may not be strong enough to meet the threshold to be recorded. 
usually this intensity threshold can be adjusted. Now the advantage with this system is that the data is easier to process. It is also less time consuming and the final results are easier to interpret. The disadvantage is that there might be very useful information in those weaker echoes and hence information might be lost by only recording the peaks. This is why in general full waveform LIDAR systems provide more information about the vertical structure of vegetation than discrete LIDAR. This figure shows a LIDAR pulse going through the canopy and the waveform returned. With a discrete LIDAR only the peaks marked with an X are recorded as seen here. In this case, the peaks represent different parts of the canopy as well as the ground. Usually the last return represents the ground, but not always. Of course, if you were to have bare ground, there would just be one return. A good number of airborne and terrestrial LIDAR systems are discrete. And here we have an example of a discrete LIDAR point cloud of a forest. And something like this can be made up of millions to billions of points to make up that point cloud. So here the points are classified into different heights according to return placement. So the first returns are those that reach the sensor first, which are usually the returns th that are coming from the top of the canopy. And then the last return is usually the ground, but not necessarily. That will depend on the density of the vegetation. So that last return can come from somewhere from the understory as well. Full waveform sensors record the entire temporal profile of the reflected laser energy through the canopy. The waveform is the distribution of this return. The main advantage of a full waveform LiDAR is having that entire echo recorded so that more, more useful, much more useful information can be extracted such as stratification between the upper and lower canopy, calculating characteristics related to vertical and horizontal structure, calculating vegetation height and canopy cover. You can also extract topography information. Now, if your ground is bare, then a full waveform LiDAR is less relevant. The downside with a full waveform LiDAR is that the processing is complex and you need to apply the right algorithm in order to filter data and extract useful information. So for example, you'll have to filter returns that are a result of haze or dust or other sources of noise. JEDI, which is a LiDAR sensor on the International Sta Space Station, has a full waveform LiDAR. And this figure shows the full waveform resulting from a near-infrared beam from JEDI on the right. The light brown area under the curve represents the return energy from the canopy, while the dark brown area represents the return from the underlying topography. The black line is the cumulative return energy starting from the bottom of the ground return to the top of the canopy. And the blue horizontal lines are the relative height metrics. Here we have a great animation from JEDI illustrating a laser pulse interacting with a multi-level forest canopy and the ground. At the end, you can see the resultant waveform generated by the return of reflected photons to JEDI. Here we have a comparison of discrete and full waveform LiDAR. On the left is a picture of the object. So on the top, there's a tower and on the bottom, it's a tree. The center is a discrete return LiDAR point cloud and the right column is a dense LiDAR point cloud derived from full waveform processing. So you can clearly see that um, the full waveform point cloud has more details and 
full waveform really allows you more control of the information that is useful for you. So uh, you don't necessarily have to get rid of those uh, weaker returns because they might contain information that is useful for your specific need. A photon counting LIDAR transmits a low power laser and its detectors are sensitive at the single photon level. The sensor records the arrival time associated with a single photon detection occurring anywhere within the vertical distribution of the reflected signal. If a photon counting LIDAR were to sit over a surface for a long time and emit hundreds of shots during this period, then the vertical distribution of the reflected photons would resemble a full waveform. With a system like this, the probability of detecting the top of the tree is not as great as detecting reflected surfaces found deeper into the canopy, where the bulk of leaves and branches are located. For this reason, the probability density function will differ according to canopy structure and vegetation physiology. So for example, the probability density function of a conifer tree will look different than a broadleaf tree. Something to note with photon counting LIDARs is that since they are so sensitive, random noise photons such as solar background noise are mixed with the signal photons and it may be difficult to discriminate between them. And one last thing to add is that the LIDAR on ISAT2 is a photon counting LIDAR. LIDAR and radar are both active systems. So what is the difference between them? A good starting point is to look at their wavelengths. Radar for vegetation studies, such as L and C bands, operate at wavelengths on the order of 5 to 25 centimeters, while LIDAR operate at wavelengths on the order of 532 and 1064 nanometers. A radar wavelength at L-band is around 250,000 times longer than a near-infrared wavelength. Because LIDARs have a much shorter wavelength, lasers can be modulated much faster and the beams can be focused to a much smaller spot on the ground. This results in LIDARs generally having higher spatial resolutions than radars. LIDARs are limited to clear atmospheric conditions and can operate uh, day and night. Radars can also operate day and night. However, they're not limited to uh, just clear atmospheric conditions. They can operate under almost any type of weather condition. So radars are like workhorses. There are many applications that LIDAR supports, anywhere from uh, forestry and vegetation studies to surface de deformation due to volcanic um, movements, uh, earthquakes, uh, groundwater extraction. Uh, you can do bathymetric studies. You can look at ice loss and gain. So you can generate uh, uh, digital elevation models, uh, digital terrain models, so there's a lot that you can do. And the next two slides I'll touch on um, just two example products that have been generated from uh, JEDI, which is the LIDAR sensor on board the International Space Station. And keep in mind that these sensors, these LIDAR sensors in space, they uh, provide a, a coarser resolution than obviously airborne and, and in-situ LIDAR sensors, however, they do provide that monitoring capability that allows to not only create these baseline um, global maps, but also uh, to monitor their change. Here we have an example of a global vegetation height map generated from JEDI. And uh, maps like these can really help define a baseline. And when you're looking at 
things, say a, a disaster such as fires, you can then go back, look at what the pre-fire conditions were, look at what the post-fire conditions uh, are, and then assess uh, the uh, amount of vegetation that was lost after such an event. Same goes with hurricanes or any sort of um, event where you have um, l loss in vegetation, loss in carbon storage. Um, and you can also uh, use this type of information to help uh, address things like uh, carbon inventories, right? So you can use vegetation height and other information uh, to develop or, or estimate biomass. And these type of products support some international initiatives such as uh, RED, for example. Uh, this is another example of a global product. Again, this one's generated by JEDI. And this is cover fraction. And so the areas that are um, brown are areas where there's no cover or very little cover. And then the areas that are green are areas with um, a dense vegetation. Again, um, information like this helps assess how um, uh, cover is changing, vegetation cover is changing through time. And this final example is from ISAT2. This is work done by Amy Neunschwander. In fact, she will uh, talk about uh, the use of ISAT2 LIDAR data for vegetation studies immediately after this presentation. But this I, I'm showing this just to give you a sense of the type of things that can be done. This is an ISAT2 transect that's going through an area that's vegetated as well as um, areas that have been um, that deforested or where there's forest degradation. And you can pick up those differences with the LIDAR returns, as you can see here. So um, you can see uh, forest experience logging and then intact tropical forest. This concludes this part of this uh, session on the fundamentals of LIDAR. Next, we'll have Dr. Amy Neunschwander. She's a research scientist at the University of Texas at Austin and ISAT2 science team member for vegetation. And she'll be focusing on ISAT2 and ATL08 land vegetation data. So how is uh, the ISAT2 data being used for vegetation studies? Thank you very much and welcome Dr. Neunschwander. Thanks Erica. Uh, my name is Amy Neunschwander and I'm with the University of Texas at Austin. And um, I'm gonna talk to you about the ISAT2 mission. And it's one of two laser altimeter missions that NASA recently launched into space. And ISAT2 has a lot of great applications, not only for ice, but as well for land and vegetation. So like the name infers, the ISAT2 mission has a, a primary science objective that is to measure the elevation and elevation change in the ice sheets and sea ice. And in particular, looking at how the impacts of, of global warming and climate change are impacting what's going on in our polar areas. An additional science objective on the ISAT-2 mission is to measure vegetation canopy height as a basis for estimating large-scale biomass and potentially biomass change over time. Recently, NASA launched the ISAT-2 mission on September 15, 2018 from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And this is a, a photograph from that, that launch. It was very exciting and thrilling. So here we're watching an animation of the ISAT-2 in its orbit. So ISAT-2, the satellite itself, is approximately 450 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And as you can see from this animation, it's what's known as a polar orbit. So it's going pretty much from pole to pole within each orbit. Um, ISAT-2 orbits the Earth in approximately 90 minutes or so. It makes a full revolution. And you can see as the Earth turns beneath the orbit, it starts to lay down this series of, of ground tracks. 
And it's through this ground track and this ground track mapping that ISAT2 collects data over both the ice sheets and sea ice. But as you can see here, it's collecting globally. So it's, it's mapping data as it moves across the oceans, across vegetation, land, as well as the, the oceans. So there's a lot of great data that, that come off of the ISAT2 satellite. In this figure, you'll notice that there's a green laser extending down to the surface of the Earth. And ISAT2 is unique in that it uses actually a green laser as opposed to a near infrared part of the spectrum to do the mapping. And this has some really neat advantages for, for looking at shallow water bathymetry in addition to mapping changes on the surface. So ISAT2, it looks like there's three beams here, but actually there's six beams on ISAT2 and they're um, organized as three beam pairs. And so the distance between each one of these beams that you see extending on the ground is roughly three kilometers in width apart from one another. So one of the things that you'll notice as we start to pan out is that you have these, we have these series of orbits. And this is what it looks like after approximately a 91 days worth of orbits. And you can see they're very converged very tightly near the poles, but in the middle latitudes, there's a lot more space in between these tracks. So one of the things that the project science office does is they, um, when they get into the middle latitudes, is they'll slightly off point the, the satellite into a different direction to basically try to fill in some of these mid latitude um, surfaces so that we don't have these large data gaps. So over time, as ISAT2 collects more and more data, they will, will collect and have a full coverage of data. Um, every 91 days, the orbits in the polar areas will fully repeat. Okay, so ISAT2, as we can see from those animations, it, it measures height changes, which is typical of all laser altimetry systems. Um, ISAT2 has a high spatial resolution in the long track direction, which is what we were seeing in that animation, but we would say it has a low resolution temporally in that every 91 days over the poles, it, it will repeat its measurements. And those repeats are, are informative because they, they give us some insight to ch seasonal changes over the ice sheets over time. In the mid-latitudes, uh, we're not necessarily repeating our measurements at all. And to this point, um, we haven't been repeating any measurements. We've been trying to fill in and collect as much data as possible. Um, in the not too distant future, we'll probably be doing some repeats in the mid-latitudes to start letting us make some inferences on change in vegetation heights. But um, by and large, the, the change measurements are taking place in the polar areas. So this is a, a diagram and some figures about the actual ISAT-2 mission. So the instrument on board ISAT-2 is known as ATLAS. So and it stands for the Advanced Topographic Laser Altimeter System. It was developed at NASA Goddard. And like all laser systems, it measures the time of flight of the, of the outgoing laser energy. And so by knowing the time of flight, as well as the pointing information and the orbit determination, we can geolocate or you know, place a spot on the ground anywhere that it reflects from. What makes ISAT-2 different from other laser altimeter systems is that it's sensitive at that single photon level. So rather than having lots of energy required to essentially trigger a return, just one little photon is enough to, to be detected with the instrument. And with this capability, it lets the instrument then have, we don't have to have as strong of a laser on board. And so by having a lower energy laser, we can run that laser at a much higher repetition rate. And so this high repetition rate of 10 kilohertz is really advantageous because it essentially puts down a laser shot on the ground every 70 centimeters in the along track direction. So it creates this really high resolution profile of, of heights across the surface of the earth. So the laser is split into six beams, as I mentioned earlier. Um, they're arranged into these three pairs, and you can see the configuration on the right-hand side of this chart. So each of these beam pairs, again, is roughly three kilometers apart in width, um, and they consist of a, a weak beam and a strong beam. And this difference in um, detection strength is to account for 
uh, changes in, in surface reflectance. Really bright targets will reflect potentially several photons back. And as you get over darker targets, less, less reflected energy comes back. So having the strong beam is, is really um, advantageous to detect uh, reflections from, this, from darker surfaces. Um, as I mentioned, ISAT-2 was launched September 15th of 2018. So we're coming up on roughly the two and a half year mark at this point. Um, the mission has a requirement to operate for a minimum of three years. Obviously, when they when they launch satellites now, there's consumables for more than five five years and beyond. So, you know, as long as everything is performing as well, you know, it's our expectation and hope that the the mission will just keep going and collecting data for a really long time. Um, one last comment is that the what's one of the really great things about ISAT two and what the Project Science Office has done is their their pointing knowledge. So they can control where the, the satellite points, I think to within, the requirement is to be within 45 meters. They're actually doing much better than that. I'd say it's probably 10 meters or better. And the, the pointing knowledge, so how well we know exactly where that, that photon is, is returned from is knowledge to probably, it's, the requirement again is six and a half meters here. But I'd say that we we're, we have that knowledge to within the two to three meter, definitely less than five meter range. Okay, so with this figure, um, this is a, a representation of the different data products that ISAT2 provides to the community. So what we have at the very top are basically the raw information that is collected by the satellite. So you have the, the telemeter data, basically those are the, the raw ranges. Um, those get combined with the pointing information, which is known as PBD, and the orbit position, so exactly where the satellite is sitting at any given time, that's the POD component. When you combine all of those elements together, you get the, the baseline product, which is ATL03. And that's the geolocated photons. And it's the, it's the product from which all of the other uh, surfaces are, are represented and, and derived from in terms of getting information. So the blue boxes that you see here, these are each of the different, essentially science disciplines that take that ATL03 geolocated photons and then create a science data product from those. And each one of these um, data products that you see, ATL06, for example, is the land ice, they each have their own unique algorithm to retrieve those surfaces and um, provide the data at different resolutions for each of the different data products. So the, the blue boxes, the level 3A data products, these are what's known as the along track data products. So it's, it's as the orbit is flying, there's no gridding or interpolation. It's basically the, the, the purest form of the science measurement, so to speak, um, derived from ATL03. And then those level 3A products can then be combined and through a series of over time into the gridded data products. So some of the gridded data products will occur weekly, as you'll see in ATL 16, which is the atmosphere product, or monthly. Um, there's monthly ocean heights. There's, um, so like I said, seasonal sea ice and land ice products. Uh, for land and vegetation, there, there will be a gridded data product. There's not one currently, but we're looking to have it start probably later this year and be updated on an annual type basis. So this is the, the basic um, ATL08 data product, which is the land and vegetation data product. And as I mentioned, each of the, essentially the science disciplines have their own unique algorithm to determine for their science. And so for land and vegetation, we want to determine both the terrain height as well as the, the relative heights of the, of the trees and vegetation above the ground. So in order to do that, the algorithm needs to to identify um, what those different elements are. Are those photons that we see in the point cloud, are they reflecting from the terrain surface? Are they reflecting from the vegetation surfaces? Or are they noise? And so once we have these photons labeled or classified in a sense, then every 100 meters in the along track direction, we calculate statistics of either terrain height or canopy heights 
as well as a lot of other parameters. And those are what's written out to the ACLO8 data product. Um, as I mentioned, the segments are in 100 meter step size. And what you see on the right hand side is, is the organization of the HDF5 data format that the data are stored. So um, the, at the top of the node is the RGT. So that's the reference to ground track is what that stands for. So a particular orbit number. And then from that, you can select one of the, one of the six beams that are on ISAT2. And then with, within each one of those beams, we have information about the photons. We have some ancillary information in terms of what's the snow flag and some other attributes. We have uh, orbit information and beam information, but the crux of the data are in the land group. And that's, those are subdivided into canopy heights and terrain heights, as well as a lot of other data products derived off of them. Um, one of the things that makes ATL8 unique from some of the other data products is that we also provide indices of those labeled photons in a, a, what's called this photons group. And so this allows you, the user, to go in and take those photons and in indices. And if you wanted to, you can map them back to the ATL03 data product. And I'll show you what I mean about that right now. OK, so this is an example of ATL03 and ATL08. So what we're looking at in the very top panel on the right hand side is a profile crossing through a, a floodplain in the Amazon crossing the Amazon River. And what you'll notice is when you look at this panel in the top, you can see some um, different co color coded photons. So the color codings, the yellow corresponds to the ground photons that were detected and labeled by the ATL08 algorithm. And then the dark green represents what we think are canopy photons. And then the light green are the top of canopy photons. And then everything that's gray that you see, these are solar background photons. So this was this particular scene was acquired during the day. So there's a lot of background um, just sunlight, you know, creates these background uh, noise photons that are detected by our detectors on ISAT2. So the algorithm has to work to try to, you know, understand which ones are actual signal photons and which ones are noise photons. Um, the bottom panel that you see, it's, it's basically the same figure that we're looking at in the top, but now I've superimposed the, the 100 meter canopy height and ground height on this profile that you see. So you can see there's very good agreement as you move along. And if we were to zoom in even tighter, you could see that the, the ground heights at the 100 meter level correspond really well with what we see at the, at the photon level. But um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that with the, the photons labeled, you yourself could go in and create the product that you see on the top by having these indices and mapping it back to the ATL03 data product. So this is another uh, river floodplain crossing in, in Brazil. And what you'll notice is that kind of a very similar uh, look to what we were seeing before, but there's a lot less background noise. There's just very few gray dots compared to before. And this particular scene was acquired during the night. So I just wanted to just kind of show and illustrate the difference between a daytime acquisition and nighttime acquisition. There's some slight differences in, in our ability to recover the surfaces, depending upon day or night. We do a little bit better at nighttime than we do at daytime. And you can probably you know, see why. OK, this is an example um, across uh, some showing illustrating some deforestation occurring also in Brazil. I seem to have a, a love for Brazil in this in this uh, presentation, but it's some really great examples. Um, what one thing that you can see in the top panel. So what we're looking at are the raw photons coming in, and this is the ATL03. So this is what you would see if you were to download that geolocated photon cloud. And as as we look, as we move from kind of left to right, we could see that there's a ground surface, but there's no vegetation. And this is where a lot of the, the logging has been occurring and there's no forest there. And as we get to roughly time 130, kind of right in the middle of your the plot, 
you can see if you look on the Google Earth image over on the right hand side that we start to um, interact with more intact forest. And so you can see that there's heights and canopy heights that are that are fully recoverable in those areas. Okay, so as as I feel that you know, in addition to ISAT2, there's a another NASA mission that was launched called JEDI. JEDI is um, a, an ecosystems investigation laser altimeter that's on the International Space Station. So the, 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 the combination of using ISAT2 data and JEDI is really advantageous because you can see one of the, the extents of the JEDI data because of the orbit that it's in, it can't map latitudes higher than approximately 52 degrees north or south. And so that's one of the real advantages of where ISAT2 can assist with doing this global canopy height assessment and potentially biomass assessment is by reaching some of these, these higher latitudes. So we've been looking at um, heights of boreal forest. You can see on the right-hand side, this is some preliminary data of two years, or yeah, roughly two years worth of data from ISAT2 in the boreal forest. And, and we're starting to get a, a good understanding of, of how those vegetation heights are distributed in this part of the, of the world and combined with JEDI, ISAT2 will make a really great uh, complement to these, these global canopy height products. So there are some tools that can help you work with ISAT2 data. Um, one of them is called For Real. It's a tool that our group has put together. And what it does, and there's a source code link as well as a, a Windows GUI that are that are downloadable. Um, it lets you be able to log in an ATLO3 file as well as an ATLO8 data product and create a plot like you see right here in this figure. So we can, it does the mapping of the photons from the ATLO8 in terms of how they were labeled or classified back to that ATLO3 data product level. Um, we cannot, you can also um, superimpose the heights from the ATLO8 product itself, so the 100 meter step size heights. Um, you can load in a reference data set. So if you have an airborne LIDAR data or a DEM that you want to compare the ISAT to heights against either of those, you're able to do that. Um, it's, a, it's a really handy tool and it's, I think it's a good way to get started in working with some of these data products if you're if you're not familiar with working with them so far. Okay, so there's if you're not aware, there is an ISAT2 applications program um, led by Sabrina Delgado, and what the it's called the ISAT2 Applied Users Program, and what this does is this helps to partner you, the user, who are interested in working with ISAT2 data how you can uh, fold it into your own studies and your own um, applications. You can get support with the Project Science Office and also partner with uh, different mission scientists who are working on the ISAT-2 missions to help with uh, your own personal discovery of ISAT-2 data. Um, they have, the applications program has quarterly webinars, which will include scientists to um, inform you about things that are going on with the mission, as well as to let uh, different applied users actually present their own research to each other. Um, you'll be in the know in terms of what's going on with the ISAT2 mission, what's the latest um, changes to the algorithm and the data products, how are the data validated and calibrated, um, as well as some other reference and lessons learned from other users. So it's a really great opportunity if you're not familiar with the program, I encourage you to get involved. Um, there's Sabrina's email is provided here. Um, I encourage you to reach out to her and get involved with it. Um, one of the highlights from one of the early adopters is Birgit Peterson, who's a senior research scientist at the USGS. And she's been looking at LIDAR data, and in particular recently, using ISAT2 data to help understand uh, burn severity mapping. So in areas uh, that are, have you know, experienced forest fire, she can use the heights and the vegetation structure that the ATLO8 data products provide um, and looking at them to kind of quantify 
what the severity of the burn was at different locations. And so you can see here in this figure that she has a, you know, a burn fire from 2017. By looking at the ISAT data that crossed over these different burn areas, she can look at the distribution of heights from low severity burns. Um, you can see that there's a lot more understory of heights compared to moderate severity. There's less, less, I guess, data points there. And then if we get into the high severity, there's even less um, vegetation information there. And so by using these different, um, the parameters on ISET too, she can um, ascertain and, and look at the quality of the, the maps and the burn severity maps that are being produced. So that's all I had today. Thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it over to Nick from NSIDC, who's going to tell you how you can access this data and fold it into your own research. Hi, my name is Nicholas Kotlinski, a data support specialist with the user services team at the National Snow and Ice Data Center in Boulder, Colorado. For this portion of the tutorial, we're going to move to a demonstration of the resources available through the NSIDC DAC. I'm going to start with a quick navigation of the NSIDC website, including the ISAT2 mission page and individual dataset landing pages to highlight our support resources. I'll then dive into our discovery, access, and visualization tools using a few different research scenarios. As you'll soon see, we have a lot of options for getting data and additional services that go along with those options. These all have different benefits or use cases depending on your individual workflow and research goals. For instance, you may want to visualize ISAT2 elevation data over a very specific time and area of interest prior to download to make sure you have all the data you need. Or maybe you already know you want to dive into using ISAT2 and you want to access and customize a bulk data order. Or maybe you want to do all of this programmatically. So we do have options for accessing and analyzing data using a Python-based workflow. So I'm going to go through all of these options, some in more detail than others. Um, and I've tried to record all of these steps so that you can follow along in your own browser. Um, but if I didn't record it, you can always come back to these resources on your own at a later time. So I'm going to start at the NSIDC homepage, nsidc.org. You can quickly get to a data set by using these key science topic icons. Uh, you can also use the free text search and enter your topic or data set of interest. So here I'll put ISAT2. Or if you know the mission or collection you want, you can click on this uh, Select Data Collection dropdown. And since we know we're interested in ISAT2, we're going to go ahead and click on that. And that'll take us uh, to the mission homepage. So I want to point out that under um, the news section of the home page, um, we do have an option to sign up for our ISAT2 mailing list, which is a great way to stay informed about new data sets um, being released and updates to data sets. So moving over to the uh, left-hand navigation, I'm going to click on the ISAT2 data sets link, which has a table of each ISAT2 data set that is currently available for download. And that table provides an overview of coverage, resolution, and key science parameters so you can easily compare across the data sets. Since our focus today is on vegetation, I'm going to click on ATL08, which is the L3A land and vegetation height data set, which will take us to the data set landing page. Every NSIDC data set, including ISAT2 data sets, has a data set homepage, which is sort of your one-stop shop for information and access to data. I'm going to start on the overview tab, which includes key parameters like file format, spatial coverage, spatial resolution, temporal coverage, and temporal resolution. So I'm going to come back to the data download tab in a bit, um, but now I just want to show you the citing these data tab. Um, and as you'd expect, this gives you citation information for the data set. Under the user guide tab, we have our user guide in PDF format, and it's embedded directly into the web page. If you want to navigate through the PDF, you can open the menu sidebar and navigate to a section of interest. These documents give a good overview of the instrument and mission design, diagrams, how files are divided, and how the data are organized within each data granule, um, and then also primary variables of interest and other really useful information. So I'd encourage you uh, to read these on your own as you start to dive into the data. 
And for more in-depth technical detail on things like height retrievals and how specific variables are derived, the Algorithm Theoretical Basis Document, or ATBD, is available under the Technical References tab. Also included here is the Data Dictionary, which provides the names, data type, and description of every single variable contained within each data granule, as well as known issues and data gaps documentation. And last but not least, our support tab contains how-to guides and frequently asked questions about the data. In this case, there's guidance on subsetting and reformatting, or what we call customization services, uh, programmatic API access to the data, and a primer on accessing data across ISAT, IceBridge, and ISAT2 missions. We also have an FAQ that sub describes subsetting services for each data set, and we provide spatial subsetting by bounding box, input KML, or shapefile polygon. Uh, temporal subsetting and variable subsetting along with several reformatting options including NetCDF, tabular ASCII, and for some of our collections including ATL08, we also provide ESRI shapefile format conversion. Um, the support tab is also where you can find the contact information for the user services office at NSIDC. And now that you've seen kind of a quick overview of the ISAT2 content on NSIDC's site, I'm going to dive into the data discovery and access. I'm going to focus on the first scenario of discovering and accessing a single data set, and I'll continue to use ATL08 here, so I've reloaded the data set landing page. I already looked at the overview tab, I browsed the user guide, and I know that this is the data set I'm interested in. So I already selected the download data tab, and I can use this interface to quickly access the data, which I'll show in a minute, but I want to do some quick exploration of the data before going straight into downloading everything. Going to the Other Access Options tab provides several great resources for access and discovery methods. I want to focus on Open Altimetry now, so I'll click there. This is a web interface that was designed specifically for ISAT and ISAT2 discovery, so I'm going to click on ISAT2. The main benefits of this tool is it allows you to focus on a region of interest and view the elevation profiles of that data with on-the-fly plotting, and then you can download the associated data after you've reviewed it. The green lines you see indicate the reference ground tracks for the most recent day. So you should see about 15 of those tracks per day indicating the 15 or so daily orbits. You can think of these reference ground tracks as the imaginary lines falling through the six beam pattern of the instrument, which gives you a sense of where the data exists. You can also see we have ATL08 selected, but other ISAT2 data sets are available to explore including ATL-13, which is an inland water product that might be of interest to some of the participants today. I'm going to ignore the rest of the widgets um, in this interface um, that are available for now so we can dive into the data. So right now you're only seeing the tracks for uh, the day we have selected and not any actual data, and so you have to zoom in in order to see more. As we zoom in, you'll notice a percentage indicator in the zoom bar that shows you how much of the data is actually being displayed, uh, which will increase the more you zoom in. Um, today, I'm interested in looking for data in northern Colorado, where I'm interested in looking at forest cover change caused by the Camera Peak fire in 2020. So I've zoomed in a little bit so you can see um, how the data is loaded while we zoom into our area of interest. Um, but because this isn't the easiest location to find, I'm going to add a map center point to this map location widget. And as I continue to zoom into my area of interest, I can update the map to recenter myself. And as I zoom in, you should have noticed some things happening, so more dots appearing, um, and these indicate the bin segments of photon data. And in the case of ATL-08, those photon segments are posted every 100 meters. And so here I'm happy with my extent, but I don't see any dots or green refer reference tracks. Instead, um, I see these red lines, which indicate reference ground tracks, but we don't have any data for this particular day on this ground track. So I'm going to click on this track that's closest to my area of interest, and I can see the track ID at the top. And I can also see the different dates available that have data on that track. I want the most recent date available, but when I click on it, I'm not getting any data in my area of interest. So I'm going to try the next uh, most recent date. And now I can see data over my area of interest. And so I can see the instru instrument beam structure of three beam pairs with the weak and strong returns on each beam.
So next I'm going to go ahead and click on select a region at the top left of the page and draw a box around my region of interest. And then I can click on um, view elevation profile and a new window will open. So now I'm presented with two plots of surface elevations on the top and canopy heights on the bottom. This is an interactive plot so I can move my cursor across and see values for the associated data. And I can also see what beam those, is, those are associated with. The legend below displays each beam ID, and we can turn those on and off to get a better sense of individual beams. For instance, I can just look at ground track 3L. Because we're looking at ATL08, the data is in 100 meter segment resolution bins but I can choose the ATL-03 photon heights tab at the top of the graphs, and now I can view the ATL-03 photon data at 70 centimeter resolution. By default, only the high and medium confidence photons are displayed, but you can select low confidence photons to get a sense of the quality. You can also add the canopy height information from ATL-08 as a trend line overlay. You can also zoom in to the data to see more detail. So here I've gone back to the Elevation Profile tab, and if I click on the menu on the right-hand side of the graphs, I can download these graphs in various formats, including PNG, JPEG, PDF, and SVG vector formats. At the bottom of the page, you also have the option to download the data. You can choose between the CSV option, which provides the key variables of interest, as well as a subsetted HDF5, which will provide all variables, but the extent is subsetted by the region you drew on your map. In the interest of time, I downloaded and opened both the CSV and HDF5 file. On the left is the CSV output in Microsoft Excel, and you can see the key variables, including latitude, longitude, terrain elevation, canopy height, and associated uncertainty values. On the right is the spatially subsetted HDF5 file, which I've opened up in Panoply, which is downloadable software available through the Goddard Institute for Space Studies website. And you can see the hierarchical structure of this file with the six beams and associated variables, variables provided in individual group folders. And this provides a nice way to view the data. In this case, I navigated to the canopy height of the right beam of the third pair, which matches what we see in the CSV file. So I've tried to cover the core features of open altimetry, but I would encourage everyone to dive into the platform themselves to get a better sense of what it can do. I also want to point out some more in-depth tutorials that have been done by my colleagues here at NSIDC that you can watch if you're interested in learning more. So while open altimetry is a great resource for visual exploration of the data, you may want to grab all the data from an extended time range or for a given area across multiple ground tracks. So this next section will cover bulk download and customization options for ATL08 data. So I'm back on the dataset landing page and I'm gonna close out the other access options window so we're in the download data tab. Here I'm presented with a map and a time range up to a current date that I can use to filter data as well as a listing of all the granules that get automatically updated based on the filter applied. Note that the time range automatically applies the current date so that we get all of the most recent data, which in this case, um, we have ISAT 2 data through November of 2020. So I'm gonna leave the time range as open as possible, but I'm gonna use the map to zoom into my general area of interest in Colorado. So I'm gonna click the little bounding box symbol in the top right of the map, which will allow me to draw a bounding box by clicking and dragging across the map. And now I can see that the table on the right was automatically updated and I now have around 14 gigabytes of data selected. I can also further filter the files by name, which can be useful if you're interested in a particular reference ground track number, which is found in the file name. So here I'm using the ground track from Open Altimetry, so I can type in the wildcard symbols and track number of 0531 to only select the granules which are in my ground track of interest. So at this point, I further refined my search to include only about 680 megabytes of data. Now I have a number of options for how to download the data, but first you should be sure that you've logged into your NASA Earth Data account using the Login to Earth Data button above the granule list. 
Once we're logged in, we can review our download options. First, using the download script, we'll download a Python script that, when run, will download the data based on your search parameters. Or you can order files directly, which will be delivered as a zip folder and a list of file URLs, or a collection of zipped folders, depending on the size of your order. It should be noted that both the Python script and zip folder options will not apply spatial subsetting or customization options to your order. To, to apply customizations to your data, you'll want to select the large custom order button, and this will redirect you to the NASA Earth Data Search site. So now we've been redirected to NASA Earth Data Search, and we have our granules listed based on the same subsetting parameters selected on the NSIDC website. We can move over and zoom to find our bounding box and a visualization of the granule selected within our area of interest. Since everything looks good, I'm going to click this Download All button to be redirected to the customization form. Once the form is loaded, you'll see several options for downloading the data. Here we want to keep the customization option selected. In the configuration settings, we should have the email associated with our Earth Data account. And then for this example, I'm going to select the shapefile reformatting option. I also want to enable spatial subsetting to clip the granule to my area of interest. I'm going to leave the temporal subsetting alone, and I'm going to go down to the variable list, and I'm going to deselect any currently selected variables. And I'm only going to download shapefiles for the canopy height variable for the GT3R beam. Once I've done this, I can hit the download data button and I'll be redirected to a download status page. When complete, you can access the zip files here, or you'll also receive an email when your order is complete with a link to the zipped folder and to a web page containing a list of the files. So now the page is showing that our download is complete and we can either download a zipped folder with all of the data directly, or we can open a web page and download individual zipped folders for individual granules. So here I've selected the web page and I can see each individual granule zip, zip file that I can download individually. And I'm going to download this one for an example. So now that I've downloaded the data and unzipped the folder, I can pull the ATL08 canopy height data directly into a GIS software of choice as an attributed point shapefile. In this case, I visualize the canopy height as colored points over Bing Satellite Imagery Web Service and QGIS. So we walked through a lot of web interface tools for discovery and access, but we also have several resources for programmatic discovery and access that cover the third scenario mentioned at the beginning of the tutorial. So here again, I'm on the ISAT2 homepage, and I can click on Tools uh, to take me to the Tools and Services page. So this page provides a table of all tools and services associated with ISAT2. We've already seen open altimetry and Earth data search, but we also have resources for Python-based access and visualization, as well as external software built for working with and visualizing ISAT2 data. And I'm now going to go through these options one by one. The programmatic access options available on our tools page include our data access and services API, uh, a Jupyter Notebook that explores the API using ISAT2 data as an example. And then there's the ISAT2 Hack Week Jupyter Notebook and Tutorial Collection, which while focused on polar research, has code examples and use cases that could be really useful for vegetation-focused users. And it's also a great entry point into a very active ISAT2 user community. One of these communities is centered around IcePix which is both a software library and a community composed of ISAT2 data users, developers, and the scientific community who are all working together to develop a shared library of resources. 
including compiling existing resources, new code, tutorials, and use cases and examples that simplify the process of querying, obtaining, analyzing, and manipulating ISA2 datasets to enable scientific discovery. This effort was started during an ISA2 hack week, but continues to grow and would really benefit from more terrestrial and vegetation application focused users. Um, it might be difficult to see anyway, but I included this class diagram not to be scary, but to show the functionality that this software has for working with ISA2 data. Moving into the world of downloadable software now for viewing ISA2 data, I'm going to start with HDF view. So with HDF view, you can browse and edit your ISA2 HDF and NetCDF files. For individual variables or parameters, you can create tables, plots, or export to text file. So this is a great tool for getting familiar with the structure of ISAT2 data um, and just genu generally getting started with the data. Photon Labeler is a free graphic user interface built for visual interpretation and labeling of ATL03 data, which I didn't focus on as much for this tutorial, but it's the geolocated photon data and is a lower level higher resolution product than ATL08 um, without the advantage of being focused on vegetation. But if you were interested in using this product and doing your own photon classification, this tool is a great resource. So this software gives you a lot of control over the labeling of photons and you can even geolink to high resolution web maps for visual reference and to help you with visual interpretation of photons. You can also save your work as plots and figures. The next tool I want to highlight is called Foreal. This tool takes ATL03 and ATL08 data as inputs and returns classified ATL03 point clouds. This tool provides a workflow I really like with lots of options available for the user. The tool provides fantastic quick photon visualization and reformatting options to get the data into formats that might be more familiar to users, including KML, CSV, and .LAS, and you can export plots as well. The next tool is Panoply, and like HDF view, Panoply can view HDF and NetCDF formats and allows you to look at the depth of the hierarchical data um, that ISAT2 data comes in. Um, Panoply has great mapping and data visualization capabilities for reviewing data after download, and you can export individual variables or parameters as plots, CSV files, or label text files. And again, shapefile reformatting is available through NASA Earth Data Search. This is a really valuable service option for ATL08 users to be able to pull ISAT2 data directly into your GIS software of choice as attributed point shapefiles. In this case, I can visualize canopy height measurements over satellite imagery showing my post-fire forest study area, and I'm ready for all kinds of analysis. To wrap up, I want to point out that there are a lot of other resources that I didn't get a chance to cover in detail. To learn more, you can visit the NSIDC DAC website and ISAT2 homepage. If you have any questions, you can contact the user services team and myself at nsidc at nsidc.org. That contact info is provided under the support tab of every data set page, and you can also get to us by clicking the green support button at the bottom right of every single web page. Uh, you can also learn more about the ISAT2 mission and technical specifications at the mission homepage. So thanks for listening. Great. Well, thank you very much to Amy Neunschwander and Nick Kotlinski. I would like to now open this session up to a Q&A. But before we do that, I wanted to let everyone know that we have a large um, representation of the ISAT uh, team online ready to answer your questions. And in addition to Amy and to Nick, we also have uh, Steve Kenner, who's the ISAT2 data project manager. Uh, we have uh, Tom Newman, who's he's had uh, some issues connecting, but he's the ISAT2 project scientist. He's been answering some questions online. Uh, we have uh, uh, Sabrina Delgado Arias, ISAT2 Applications Coordinator. She's based at NASA Goddard. And we also have uh, possibly Claudia uh, Carabajal. She's an ISAT2 Research Scientist at NASA Goddard.
So with that, let's just then start working our way down the Q&A on the Google Doc. So what we've been doing has been assembling the questions you've been posting on the chat docs. And so we've been putting them on the document that you can see. And so we'll just start uh, working our way down. Um, so the first question, how are the Doppler LIDARs used for wind component measures, measurements different from TLS, terrestrial laser scanning? Um, okay, so uh, first of all, th there are different types of LIDARs out there. And we focused on laser altimetry. Um, but in terms of um, LIDARs for, for example, atmospheric studies, uh, they do use a slightly different um, uh, uh, technology. So uh, the the atmospheric, um, so there are atmospheric backscattering lidars that record the backscattering from molecules and, and particles in, in the atmosphere, um, including like clouds and, and aerosols, wind. Uh, there's also spectral absorption lidar measurements. Now, in terms of Doppler uh, lidar, it is um, operating at the same wavelengths as what we've talked about here. But basically, it's resolving um, time measurements in the line, line of sight of the air velocity and the attenuated aerosol backscatter. Um, so it does operate in the near infrared. And it's primarily it's sensitive to the backscatter from atmospheric aerosols. OK. So the next question. I'm wondering if the Earth's speed is taken into consideration in the case of spaceborne LIDAR systems. Uh, so I'll let uh, Amy answer this question. Go ahead, Amy. Hi. Um, yes, yeah, so both um, the, the relative velocity of both the Earth and the spacecrafts are taken into consideration when, geolit when doing the geolocation for the LIDAR returns. I don't know how elaborate of an explanation you want or if that's... Uh... Yeah, no, that's great. I, I, I think um, it, okay. it was uh, good to make that clarification. And it was a good question too. Um, okay, so question three, is it possible to assess vegetation health from forest infested with insects through LIDAR? Amy, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, so generally I would say no, um, because LIDAR is looking at structure and typically when, when you have damage from insects, they're attacking the, the tissue of the, of the trees, let's say, for example. So usually um, insect stress is, is more easily detected from uh, multispectral or hyperspectral imagery is where you'll see it first. Over time, um, you you know, as the, the tree starts to degrade from other, you know, drought and other uh, stress factors, you might get a change in structure. But um, as a by and large, no. Um, now, with the with the Jedi waveforms, it's possible that you might see some differences in the actual waveform structure compared to, um, you know, a healthy plant from a diseased tree. But um, particularly with ISAT2, we're not going to detect um, any of those differences. Okay, uh, question four, what is the height resolution accuracy we can achieve from LIDAR? So these are um, really a function of, of the instrument characteristics. Um, you know, how, how fast is it sample? What are the detector capabilities? What's the pulse width of the energy going out? Um, as well as kind of in general, how, how well is that surface that you're sampling, you know, with the LIDAR, how well is it sampled? So when we're thinking of, of trees, for example, um, if it's sampled with, with lots of points, then it's more likely that one of those points is going to represent the, so let's say, the true height of that tree. When you get into a, a sampling where you might only get, you know, one or two points coming back, um, it's, it's kind of becomes a statistics game. So is that 
point that is reflected, is it really reflecting off of the top of the tree or is it somewhere in the middle of the canopy, you know, a lower down branch? So there's there's lots of those kind of statistical games in terms of how something is characterized and represented. When we think about ISAT2, you know, we're looking at combining, in many cases, we combine lots of photons together to give us an estimate of what that surface height is. So whether it's the, the ice sheets or even um, terrain surfaces over land, you know, we, we calculate, we take lots of photons and we calculate a, a median height, let's say for example, that we use to represent the, the land surface at that particular latitude and longitude. And, you know, with, with ISAT2, we've been observing terrain heights, you know, with RMSE errors that are typically around half a meter or a little bit better, which, you know, from a space-based system, I think is, is really amazing. And we're seeing that globally, not just in a, a given location. Great. Uh, question five. I was wondering if there are any openly available algorithms or a repository of algorithms dedicated for full waveform LIDAR filtering to remove haze, dust, et cetera, and extract useful vegetation structure. So the, the next session, uh, which is on Thursday, will be a demo on JEDI. And um, that session will show you some tools available to process JEDI data. Um, but but uh, I don't know if anyone from ISAT2 would want to add to that or? Um, yeah, I, I don't know of any other than, um, you know, I know it, that a lot of people are starting to really dig into, into the JEDI tools. Um, so I would, yeah, but I haven't worked with any specifically, so I can't really comment. Right. So, so yeah, great question. Uh, let's um, wait until uh, the next session to really take a look and, and learn about all of the different tools available for JEDI data, which is a full waveform. Remember, ISAT2 is a photon counting LIDAR. All right, so question six, on the comparison between LIDAR and radar, won't the optical wavelengths used by the LIDAR as the probing signal be affected by absorption by the plant canopy apart from being reflected backscattered in a stricter sense? So the way that ISAT2 works is we're, we're still detecting the reflected photons coming back. So even though there is some absorption, um, that just basically means we don't get that particular photon back, but we do get the photons that are reflected back. So, um, you know, we're, we're still able to, even with using um, with LIDAR and even with green energy LIDAR, uh, we're able to, you know, detect uh, unique um, heights and discrete heights within, within say, for example, a forest canopy. Um, you know, in terms of the differences between the LIDAR and radar, um, you know, I, I haven't looked yet specifically at, um, you know, really trying to, to look at the heights in, in overlapping areas between these two systems, you know, and, and to look at the differences. But um, I can say we do get, we do get lots of reflected and backscattered energy back from vegetation. Okay, question number seven. How to distinguish the return from clouds or the or other atmospheric disturbance in the LIDAR ISAT2 data? Yeah, so this is a really great question and it's a really challenging question because as we were developing the, the algorithm to pull out land and vegetation, um, you know, we weren't really factoring into the fact into account that oh there might be some low lying clouds in our in our return signal as well. And particularly with the green laser, we've seen cases where you know you can actually see, you can penetrate through the cloud and you can see the cloud and then still the energy is also reflected from the surface as well. And so um, it's been a challenge to you know kind of think about how do we deal and, and work with clouds that might be in our data. Um, so when the clouds are high enough above the surface, we can we just go ahead and outright reject them. Um, when we're going in and, you know, looking specifically for, for ground and vegetation heights so that we don't confuse um, the, the heights in any way. But when we have um, areas that have low clouds or fog, you know, it's, it's really it's really difficult um, to discern a, a fog 
a photon reflecting from a fog or a cloud, you know, how does statistically, how does that look different than a photon reflecting from vegetation canopies? So um, this is something that we're still, the science team is still working on how to address, but it's it's possible that there are some ATO level heights that might be incorrect due to the pre presence of low-lying clouds or fog. Okay, question number eight. Do we need to take into account Earth's speed in the case of spaceborne LIDAR? Um, absolutely. These, the velocity of both the spacecraft and the Earth um, is a factor and a component in the geolocation algorithms that, that produce those uh, X, Y, and Z heights for each photon. Great. Question nine. Are LIDARs used in cities' urban surveys and for agriculture? Um, yes, yeah, so they, they, their lidars can be used for a lot of different applications. Um, so I, I presume for like airborne surveys, um, the the lidars are, are typically the same. Um, most most systems use an infrared um, lidar system. However, you might have different acquisition parameters um, depending upon the application. So if you were mapping a, a city with an airborne lidar system, um, you might map it differently than if you were doing a an agricultural or a rural area. Um, for ISAT 2 and, and for JEDI, you know, there's no way to adjust the collection parameters, so to speak. Um, what we do, dependent upon the surface type, so what we do is, um, you know, that the algorithms that go in and try to discern um, what surface those photons or waveforms might be reflecting from. So one of the things on, on that we do for ISAT 2 um, on the ATL-08 data product is we also provide the, the land cover classification um, as defined by the, the MODIS products, and those will help users um, interpret their heights. Let's go on to question number 10. In the case of the 532 nanometer laser, which is a green light, do we need to correct for the sunlight during daytime when we measure the intensity of photons back to the sensor during the daytime? So this was answered by Amy, and um, yes, you do need to, to correct for that. And she did show an example, the difference um, in, in uh, uh, solar photons between day and night, it's strikingly different. So you do correct most ISAT2 data products include metrics on the background rate of photons, particularly ATL03, 04, and 9. So they all include photon background rates. Um, Okay, so question uh, l let me uh, skip to question 12. We'll come back to question um, 11. Multispectral data such as Landsat data, radar, and hyperspectral data are also used for the LIDAR applications presented here. What factors should one consider to decide when to use LIDAR data? If I can analyze a similar phenomenon using multispectral Landsat or microwave data, why should I consider using LIDAR data? Okay, so I can um, answer this based on my perspective. So my strengths are in radar remote sensing. And I can tell you that, you know, all of these data sets have their unique information content. Um, so, so Landsat optical data sets are sensitive really to the chemical properties of the land surface, the spectral uh, properties of the land surface. So if you want to identify, say, different types of species, uh, then you use optical, you know, based on their, their spectral characteristics. Now, radar and LIDAR will give you uh, similar geophysical parameters. They will give you information on structure. However, LIDAR is going to give you information on structure at a much higher um, resolution than, uh, than radar can give you. Okay, the nice thing about radar is we do have continuous global coverage. And so radars are like, as I mentioned, they're like workhorses, right? So you can, um, it, you have not only a, a monitoring capability with radar, but it's a, a, a pretty much an all weather capability. So ultimately it depends on your application as Amy answered. Um, 
Landsat hyperspectral give you two dimensional data sets at a variety of wavelengths um, in the optical range. Uh, LIDAR provides that third dimension and uh, it can complement these other data sets. So you might know the type of vegetation, but with LIDAR um, on top of that, you might want to assess if that particular type of vegetation is perhaps a degraded forest or if, um, uh, if it, it, structurally it's different from another similar type of vegetation or a different type of vegetation. Okay, so let's go back. If Amy, are you available? Are you there? Yeah, I'm back. Okay, great. So question 11, following slide 10, can LIDARs, can LIDAR wavelengths be in any part of the spectrum or LIDAR only emits in two wavelengths? And is there a particular reason why 532 and 1064 nanometers are selected? So I think um, theoretically, yeah, you could have an active sensor that runs at, at any any wavelength. Um, 1064 is a is a common uh, wavelength laser that is manufactured, and I assume that there's um, reasons behind that I'm that I'm not aware of. Um, if you frequency double the 1064, you get the 532, which which is why that's a very common um, wavelength that's used as well. So those tend to be the two most common. Um, LIDAR wavelengths that are used for um, kind of Earth observing type studies. There are some uh, terrestrial systems, and another wavelength that people use is is like around 1550, which is um, kind of another frequency doubling, so to speak, or um, don't say frequency doubling, I don't think that's the correct word, but um, it's another wavelength that's used with. Uh, LIDAR applications, and it has different, all of these different wavelengths have different um, properties in terms of how that energy interacts with the surface and how they, how those surfaces reflect energy at that given wavelength. Um, and and I'll, I'll kind of stop there because I could, yeah. Great. Um, so now let's go to question 13. Can LIDAR be used in ocean bathymetric? studies or is it only limited to land water like rivers and lakes is it affected by waves by the accuracy and precision right so this is a really great question and really exciting because this is one of the the things with um with iset 2 that you know knowing that there was a green laser on it on board you know we, we knew that it would have some capabilities for bathymetry but once we started getting the data back it was really exciting just to see how much capability and bathymetry can be derived using ISAT2 data. Um, so one of the things, so uh, people are looking at it, not only for inland water and lakes, but looking at um, kind of coastal nearshore bathymetry. And I think Tom Newman posted somewhere within this uh, document, uh, a link to some some works that's, that's being done looking at bathymetric studies. Um, so there's there's several peer-reviewed publications already out on how the bathymetry is derived from ISAT2. Um, and one of the things that um, are, is being studied, you know, what impacts, yeah, does wave structure have necessarily on the bathymetry that's coming out? What other properties in the atmosphere or the water column, um, the, the bottom type, how do, how do those all play together in terms of determining what that bathymetric signal is going to look like? Um, I can say with the accuracy that we've detected from the bathymetry studies that I've seen so far, it's really on par with what we're getting um, above above the water surface. So what the RMS ears that we see over land, like I said, it's about half a meter or so. We, we tend to see similar RMS ears for bathymetric um, below water surfaces compared to other um, survey data sets. Great. Uh, next question, number 14. What is the spatial resolution for LIDAR data? Does the data collected from LIDAR satellites have global coverage? So in, in the case of ISAT2, Amy, go ahead. Uh, ISAT2 does, yes. So it, it's in a polar orbit. So the inclination angle is actually 92 degrees. So we get coverage from 
um, 88 degrees north down to 88 degrees south. So there's just a, a little little bit of land right at the poles that's not mapped by ISAT2. Um, this that's one of the real one of the advent advantages of ISAT2 is that it does have this um, global coverage um, in looking at um, lands above, um, for example, what the, the International Space Station can achieve at, at 52 degrees, ISAT2 can reach um, lands higher in latitude and, and map those surfaces very well. Um, let's see, just to mention, the spatial resolution was another question what's in there. So in the long track direction, ISAT2 is putting down a, a basically a laser shot on the ground every 70 centimeters in the long track direction. So as the, as the satellite is orbiting above, again, it's, it splits its energy off into six beams. Each one of those beams puts down a shot on the ground every 70 centimeters. And um, each one of those beams, the footprint within that is roughly um, 11 meters in diameter. So as you're moving along in time, it creates um, basically a, a kind of a continuous profile across the surface of the Earth. Okay, great. Uh, let's go on to question 16. Question 15, it's a repeat of uh, a previous question. So question 16, in terms of data processing and analysis, what can you say about LIDAR data as compared to hyperspectral radar or Landsat? Okay. Yeah, so I mean, again, I think um, it, it, it's, it's kind of the answer that's already been embedded here already. Um, it depends on what you're familiar with in working with. Um, anytime you start working with a new sensor system, there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve just to understand some of the nuances of the data and how they're structured and organized. Um, Landsat data are probably pretty um, relatively intuitive user interface and the, and the data products are pretty intuitive for people to understand what they look like. Um, you know, oftentimes they're just imagery products that can be loaded directly into ArcGIS or QGIS um, and, and can be analyzed readily. Um, LiDAR data is a little bit maybe a little bit more challenging. It's not quite as user friendly. Depends on how the data are, have been processed already or um, are they just, are they raw products kind of coming out or kind of preliminary products or are they created into gridded um, elevation models and canopy height models? So it, it just kind of depends on on what, what data you're looking at. Um, there's an open altimetry of what was demoed earlier in, in the webinar. Um, that's a, a site and it provides an interface for users to get comfortable looking at some of the data collected by ISAT2 as well as ISAT um, in a kind of a user-friendly way so you can look at okay at a given location what is my um, you know what are my heights here tell me and then those those heights and elevation data products can be um, exported out specifically for a particular location. Great. Uh, okay, question number 17. How suitable is ISAT2 data for tropical forests? Uh, I mean, so that would be relative to the dense um, vegetation in terms of penetration. Mm -hmm. Sorry, detection. Go ahead. Yeah, so tropical forests are, are definitely challenging, specifically for those reasons, because the, the vegetation is so dense. And with ISAT2, um, compared to JEDI, ISAT2 has a much uh, lower sampling rate. Um, but even despite that, you know, I've seen some really great ISAT2 data over tropical forests, which I was personally, I was quite surprised to see. Um, there's obviously going to be instances where cloud cover kind of obscures what we're looking at. And, you know, if the atmosphere is really humid, you, we might not get a, a lot of great data back. But um, there's also quite a bit of data that I've seen that look really great. We're able to detect the ground as well as the, the canopy heights. And, you know, I've seen some preliminary studies, um, even looking at the canopy height retrievals um, in these forests, and they're, you know, kind of on par with, with canopy height, the accuracies that we're getting with canopy heights and some other ecosystems. So it's, it's, it's pretty, it's really encouraging. And I was, I was very pleasantly surprised. 
Super. All right, question 18. Is it possible to combine ISAT2 with JEDI data? What's the challenge? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, I think that's the goal of, of everyone um, on, on the ISAT2 team as well as the JEDI team. I think these are two, you know, in many ways, very complementary missions. Um, the heights, we, we, the in terms of when the data products were being defined for both missions, one of the things that we kind of set to make sure would happen is that the the heights, you know, heights are always always derived with respect to some reference ellipsoid or some surface. And so the reference ellipsoid that um, ISAT2 uses is the same as what JEDI uses. Um, some of the other parameters in terms of how the the, the positioning and all of that information is, is done in a very similar way so that they would be as, as complementary as possible. Um, there are some subtle differences in terms of how some of the the vegetation structural parameters are calculated. So if you're if you're looking at doing biomass estimations and you're and you're and you've been looking at um, using these relative height metrics, so something like an RH50 or an RH75, those are, are calculated slightly different on ISAT2 than they are on JEDI. So kind of understanding some of those nuances should go into your assessments of, you know, I wouldn't necessarily just apply a, a JEDI biomass model directly to ISAT2 data. There may be some some biases there, but um, in general, the, the idea is that, yeah, they could be combined and, and used in complementary um, in complementary ways. There are some um, positioning uncertainties. So one of the things that um, we talked about in the webinar is what's known as the, the geolocation accuracy. So when you have a latitude and longitude that's derived for whether it's your ISAT2 derived heights or your JEDI waveform, you know, how, how good is the accuracy, that latitude and longitude for that given height value? Um, with ISAT2, we've been getting, well, we, we've done some comparisons um, to test that geolocation accuracy, and it's um, it's better than five meters globally. Um, I think uh, JEDI is not quite to that level of of accuracy yet. Um, I know doing the that component of positioning information on the International Space Station is, is challenging, just because it's in a a more dynamic of a an orbit and platform than than say ISAT2 is. So it's it's a little bit trickier in some cases for for that geolocation um, to be kind of pinned down. But I know that 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 team is working really hard to to uh, reduce those those uncertainties in, in the positioning of, of the Jedi products. Great, thank you for that. Actually, and on Thursday's uh, presentation. Um, it will cover some of these issues, these geolocation issues, and the version two of the JEDI data that will soon be released, which has greater um, accuracy, positional accuracy. Okay, so question 19 What is the exact size of ISAT 2 LiDAR footprint? So, um, from what we can tell at this point, um, we've set up a series of or the project to set up a series of corner cube detectors out at uh, White Sands Missile Range as well as um, 88 South in Antarctica. And by looking at the, the positioning of those really tiny corner cube detectors with respect to um, our knowledge of where the satellite is pointing, uh, they've determined that the footprint is about 11 meters in diameter. I'd say plus or minus a meter and a half um, depending a little bit on some of the atmospheric conditions, um, et cetera, that can slightly change the, the perceived diameter. Okay, question 20. Give an example of ground-based LiDAR platform. So what we've done is we've placed a link there with examples of PLS. Uh, okay, question 21. Are you generating a baseline for each day of year and latitude for solar source stray photons? to later filter them out from LiDAR data. Right, so um, on ISAT2, what, what, what they do at the ATL03 data product is they look at the background uh, noise rate. Um, and obviously there's some um, 
knowledge in terms of the, the latitude, the day and the year, and the reflectance. But there's there's definitely some um, variability that's detected. So one of the things that is calculated on the data product is that um, that background rate. And we use that to help. Um, one of the things that all of the algorithms do is ultimately we want to determine, you know, which of the photons are reflecting from actual surface and which ones are our background noise photons that we should ignore. So by having an understanding of what the, the, the general background noise rate should be in combination with the, the surface reflectance, we can, that helps to make some of those decisions in terms of whether a photon is a surface photon or, or a noise photon. So that leads into the next question. How difficult is it to differentiate the solar photons from the surface ones? Um, it's if you're looking at a, a photon side by side from a noise photon versus a surface photon, there's there's no difference. It's, it's just a photon. So again, with ISET two, everything is kind of a statistics game. So with with surface photons, we're assuming we're assuming that they're um, in closer proximity to other photons that are reflecting also from the surface. So um, to distinguish them apart, we look at those those differences in how close they are to their neighbors to make some assumptions as to whether those photons are from the surface or from a, a background, just a random noise photon. Great. And then uh, how do you filter ISAT2 data for day and night? For so for day and night, on the, as a user, there's um, there's a day night flag that is on the HL08 data product. Um, there's also the solar elevation angle is also provided on probably all of the data products. I, I can speak explicitly for HL08 as well as HL03. Um, so if you look at the if you were to filter the solar elevation, um, you know from zero to five degrees would be probably um, kind of dusk or twilight, and then below zero degrees, that would indicate you're in kind of a full nighttime uh, scenario. Okay. Um, then how do how to verify ISAT to LiDAR data derived heights on the ground? Right. So what uh, most folks do is look at validating the heights against some other reference surface. So this is can be GPS-derived um, heights from, say, a GPS survey or some airborne LiDAR surveys. Um, that tends to be the most common uh, method. And on, if you go to the ISAT2 uh, website, you can see several publications that uh, members of the science team, as well as just other people in the science community, have, have been looking at the ISAT2 heights. Great. So I'm, I'm seeing a, a, a last question here that directly ties to this. Um, someone is asking how accurate is it to use ground-based LiDAR as TLS to validate? Yeah, that could be another another source as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, any any data can be compared to any other data source. So you can compare the ISAT2 heights to um, other elevation models, to other um, airborne LiDAR or terrestrial LiDAR data sets to GPS data points, um, you know, so it's more of what confidence do you have in the, the what you're using as your reference source, you know, what, what is its accuracies and uncertainties. Right, okay. Uh, next question, uh, number 25. Can LiDAR be used to measure aerosol concentrations or smoke plume heights from fires? Yes. So the answer is yes. Um, there is a an atmospheric data product on ISAT2 known as ATL09, and it provides uh, metrics for different heights and reflections and reflecting layers within the atmosphere. And actually, they create these really cool um, JPEGs of the whole atmospheric profile that users can look at, and you can see smoke plumes and other aerosols. Um, you know, within that layer that's detected. So it's a it's a very active area of research that uh, people are working on. And um, but yes, is the answer to the question. Great. Question twenty six: Which ISAT two product is best used for shallow water bathymetry? Right. So there's not a specific shallow water bathymetry product. Um, 
depending upon what you're interested in looking at, um, you, there's an inland uh, inland water data product. So that's on ATL 13, and that does have some bathymetry values uh, provided for um, inland lakes and, and rivers, larger water bodies. Um, but also what people have been doing so far is, is really just kind of going back to that ATL 03 photon cloud and looking and kind of interrogating that that particular data product, um, especially since there's, like I said, there's not a, a uh, an official shallow water bathymetry product available. Looking and really interrogating that ATLO3 photon cloud is, is kind of the way that people have been doing it. Um, there's an early adopter um, from one, the ISAT2 mission. His name's Chris Parrish. He's a professor at Oregon State University. And he's been looking at fusing um, shallow water bathymetry derived from ISAT2 with um, Landsat data as well as Sentinel data, I think, and created a, a product called Shallow Shallow Water Sorry Shallow Bathymetry Everywhere.com. There's a link in the in the document, and it's a it's a really neat data product that um, is getting getting produced, and they're using ISAT2 data to to basically create the, the validation and, and modeling for for these data these shallow water bathymetry products okay question 27 I hope this one is for Nick or Steve and for real can we process multiple HDF5 files at a time actually I'll handle this one since we our group is the one that created for real okay. um, so we can process multiple H DF5 files, but you can do it, set them up in a batch processing, but it, it doesn't analyze them individually. Each beam is still um, kind of processed on a beam by beam basis. And there is a um, kind of reading ahead to the next question. Is there a, a version of Foreal for Linux? And uh, yes, there is. There's, or there's Python source code that's available up on GitHub, and we run it in a Linux environment. Internally, so okay, great. Um, okay, so then let's go on to question 29. ISAT 2 data can detect two meter. Can ISAT 2 data detect two meters height mangroves in shallow wetlands? Um, it it should. I haven't specifically uh, looked, but um, I have observed some shrub and woodlands in that two meter height range that are clearly detectable. So I would anticipate uh, something very similar in, in shorter mangrove areas. Um, when the heights get to be less than, let's say, around a meter to less than a meter of shrubs or whatever you're looking at, then that starts to, to be, I apologize for my dog, um, that starts to be within the kind of the, the uncertainty and the noise range of where we might, it's, it's difficult to distinguish ground photons from really low, low vegetation structure. But you need about a meter or more of, of vegetation height difference to really distinguish those things. Okay. Uh, next question, is ISAT2 data available on Google Earth Engine or is there a plan for it to be available? Well, this is Steve Tanner. I'll, I'll uh, answer this one. So there are uh, active uh, work going on to move uh, ISAT2 data and the services and all of the tools associated with it cloud-based access, but we don't have any uh, dates that uh, we can make public yet on uh, making that kind of thing available. But there is active work going on to uh, to make this uh, data available uh, via cloud services. Okay, so when it does become available, Steve, how can people find out? Is there a, an email? Oh, uh, we'll, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll definitely make some announcements so uh, when that becomes available. And as Nick had uh, said, there are uh, uh, notification services that you can subscribe to or anything associated with ISAT2 that we are doing there. But when we begin going live with the data in the cloud, we will be making some noise about that. So you should you should be uh, well aware of that. Super. All right, the next question, number 31, how does ISAT2 errors from water surfaces compare with errors in canopy elevations? Can this be used to find shorelines and forested areas? And how deep can it penetrate in an ocean? Uh, 
Amy, uh, can you? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if anybody else wanted to, to talk or I guess I can keep on going. Um, air from water surface, I, I think it really depends on, again, the, the roughness of the water surface. Um, I think for, for smooth, um, smooth water, particularly where they look at the leads. So when you're looking at sea ice and you have the, the small, let's say open, uh, this elite of water in between those different ice patches, it's very smooth there. And they've been seeing accuracies um, within just a couple of centimeters. As you get into open ocean, um, and you have a variety of roughness of the waves, you get a lower photon rate. Um, so the, the surface accuracy is, is a little bit uh, lower and less accurate than what we see where we have really smooth water with lots of photons coming back. Um, but it's probably something on the order of, of a meter, kind of similar to what we see with the canopy elevations. Okay. Uh, next question, is there a limitation to the number of requests that can be made through the API? I will let NSIDC answer this one. Yeah. I'm sorry, this, this is Steve. I stepped out. Are we talking about the question 32? Uh, yes, correct. Uh, Nick can probably answer this uh, better than I, but yeah, there, there, is, uh, there are some limits for each call relative to an API call. And, and in the uh, notes there, uh, Nick has listed those. It's basically um, uh, 100 files for the synchronous request and 2,000 for the asynchronous request. So what users typically do is they write a program that'll loop through the data to, to gather it all. So there is a per call limit, but there's not an overall limit. Okay. All right, question 33, how do you separate strong beams from weak beams? Um, the way that I do it personally is I actually, sorry dog, um, I look actually look at the beam number because it's something that doesn't change regardless of it, how the satellite is oriented. Um, so beams number one, three, and five um, are the strong beams and those are found, there's a beam number that's found actually on the data product. So as you're looking through the data, you can search by beam number. Oftentimes they're, um, they're in their full name, if you were to download the data product, it will say um, maybe ground track one left. And so knowing which, whether it's the left beam or the right beam is the strong or weak, that, that will depend depending upon how the satellite is oriented. So as I start to really dig into the data, I personally use the actual beam number. Um, because like I said, they're, they're consistent through time regardless of, of orientation. Okay. Uh, then that leads to the next question. Can you explain beam splitting? Six beams at approximately three kilometers apart. Uh, so perhaps you can just clarify that part. Right. So the reason why we do this is that um, having having six beams, obviously we get more coverage, and that's one of the things that we're very interested in doing. Um, by having them arranged in these beam pairs, so each each beam pair, there's three of them, um, they're, the weak and the strong beam within each pair are roughly 90 meters apart. And what's, what that lets us do is that as the satellite is going over, we're able to derive the slope in between of the, of the terrain surface in between each of those, those two beams. Um, so this lets us kind of have some understanding of, okay, what's the local slope um, rather than if we were to repeat and look at that same track, say 91 days from now, and you see an elevation change, you know, is that elevation change, was it due to an actual elevation change or is it due to surface topography? So by, by having this um, ability to derive the slope on each pass, it lets us get a better understanding upon what that, that local topography is. And then by having them three kilometers apart, then we can kind of look at, at larger, uh, topographic patterns on the terrain surface. Okay. Uh, okay, a couple more questions. How about two more questions before we close out the session? Uh, do we need to discard the data with high uncertainty? Um, 
it, it's it's up to you and it, probably whatever your application is. And a lot of, uh, before the data products are created, if, if we know that some points are just totally invalid, those are, those are completely rejected and, and not even provided to you, the user. But as you start to really uh, look yourself at the, at the data that are produced and provided to you on the data products, um, it's kind of up to the user in terms of what, what is your acceptable threshold for, for accuracy. Um, I know the, the land ice people, they like to have uh, data and studies with um, certainties better than 10 centimeters in order to feel that they have confidence in their measurements. Um, and they have lots of photons to work with, whereas if we were to do something similar in land, we might lose a lot of, uh, of photons and data analysis. So, you know, each data product has its own metrics on what would be an uncertainty, and, and you, the user, can then define and set your own kind of threshold criteria for what's what you would consider being good data. Okay, great. And then the last question, how can you, uh, or can you elaborate on the reason for having six laser beams? Which beam to use? How do you decide whether you want to use the, the strong beam or the weak beam, for example? Um, again, it kind of depends on your application. If you're looking at over land um, and vegetation, if you want to look at someone's mom house, for example, um, I would typically use the strong beam just because you get four, roughly four times the number of photons back than you do in the weak beams. So again, with, with more photons back, you, we can resolve those surfaces a little bit better and, and the heights will tend to be um, a little bit more accurate than they are with the, with the weak beam. But that's not to say that the weak beam isn't usable, but the, the odds are we'll get uh, more meaningful and probably more, a little bit more accurate heights with the strong beams. Great, okay. So um, we're at the top of the hour. I just um, want to let everyone know that the rest of the questions, uh, we've compiled them. We've compiled all of your questions in this Google Doc, and the ones we weren't able to answer, we will post all of these online so that you can go back and uh, reference um, questions and the answers. So. I'd like to thank the ISAT2 uh, group that joined us today, Amy, uh, Nick, Steve, Sabrina. Um, thank you very much for answering all these questions and, and Tom Newman as well. And um, thank you everyone for joining and we will uh, reconnect then on Thursday at the same time where we'll have a, a session on LIDAR this time focused on Jedi data. All right, thank you. Uh, wishing you all a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.